Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for the introduction. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Thank you for having me again. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll reiterate what I said last week. Uh, I consider it an uh, incredible honor to be able to speak here at Gordon. It's uh, the favorite institution uh, that I have studied or trained at, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the most important eras of my life. So thank you for the chance to be here. Uh, last time I was here, uh, we talked a little bit about the current state of cancer uh, and where cancer research and treatment are. Uh, this, this week's topic is a little bit less scientific and a little bit more personal. Uh, I would like to describe some of my own experience learning the art of the practice of medicine and the ways that my faith and my profession have woven through each other at different times during my training and my career. The term patient care is a phrase that is invoked so frequently during the medical education process that I think it's easy to forget what it actually means. On its surface, its meaning is obvious. Somebody is sick and a healthcare provider makes decisions to try to treat their illness. Or somebody is healthy and a medical caregiver gives them recommendations on how to stay that way. On a deeper level though, there's a humanitarian dimension that goes far beyond these simpler exchanges. It's interesting to me that the term includes the verb to care. In a broad sense, this focuses the process on our relationship with other people. And often in this procession, in this profession, it means that our relationship is with complete strangers, people that we've never met before. One thing you learn quickly in the medical training process is that your patients and your colleagues will possibly not share the same values or beliefs as you. And this dynamic has actually shaped my view of who my neighbor is probably more than anything else in my life. To start, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the current structure of medical education and observe how patient care integrates into that. Medical school starts with two years in the classroom, with days full of lectures and labs, during which you get to know 99 other people as if they are part of your family. You encounter innumerable concepts and terms that you've never heard before. Overall, the experience can be very bewildering, even before you've ever met a sick person. During these years, the actual patient care experience begins with actors who are portray hired to portray an illness so students can practice taking a history and performing a physical exam. This is my daughter, Livy who is practicing on my wife, Angela, taking a history during a time of recent illness. Pretend illness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe every few weeks, there's an opportunity to follow a practicing physician uh, through their clinic and observe them. And then the third year of medical school is spent on the inpatient wards and in the outpatient clinics during which you learn to talk to real patients under close supervision and with no actual responsibility. Mostly the goal at this stage is just to not look foolish or say anything that betrays which units you were paying less attention to during those first two academic years, <laughs> which nobody succeeds at, by the way. The fourth year of medical school is uh, focused on gaining experience in the specialty that you plan to uh, pursue a residency in. And then uh, you match in a residency and you feel like you've met your lifelong goal. This is me on match day. I was one of the lucky ones who was happy with the match spot that he got, as you can see. And if you are interested in an example of the tyranny of the passage of time, this guy is back there in the orange shirt and I feel like he's getting ready to leave for college himself. <laughs> the thing you realize as residency begins is that at no point in the process so far have you ever been directly responsible for a patient's life. You've never had to make a medical decision 
without immediate feedback from a supervising resident or attending, and the training process has really just begun. It isn't until residency starts, when you're the person writing orders, answering pages, getting yelled at by nurses, spending the most time with patients, that the colorful dimensions of patient care become most vivid. You become one of the first people responsible for distilling a patient's story into a few possible diagnoses and then developing a workup and a treatment plan. These pic this is a picture I took of the clock on my first day on the wards when I was questioning my life decisions. <laughs> and then this is an actual page that someone sent me just to emphasize how bewildering a situation it can be. What did you say? Oh, AM, AM, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't get better. <laughs> As one of the first people that the patient encounters, you take the full force of their pain, their frustration, their anxiety, and their fear. And sadly, it's common for residents to develop an ugly pessimism about patient care during this phase, especially early in the process when you're exhausted. The stress level is really high, you have an 80-hour work week. We had 30-hour ICU shifts straight through. There's fear of making a mistake or harming someone with a misdose medication or confusing one patient's details with another. All of these things add a strain that puts even the most resilient trainee at risk. And it's even worse when you have a bit of a spiritual crisis on top of it. The summer after I graduated from Gordon, it's a bad sign if I'm crying at this point in the talk, by the way. <laughs> the summer after I graduated from Gordon, I would have characterized my belief system as ironclad and reassured. But the truth is it was somewhat untested. The journey away from Gordon through medical school and then residency nearly dismantled it completely. Foundations of my belief system really started to crack when my dad passed away from lung cancer about a week, uh, I'm sorry, about a year after I graduated from Gordon. It was the first hammer strike to what I now recognize was a somewhat naive spiritual worldview. My dad was diagnosed with three separate cancers over the course of his life. He had thyroid cancer when I was young, he had prostate cancer when I was in high school, and then lung cancer a few years after that. And with each diagnosis, he weathered treatment without resentment or bitterness, and his profession of faith and trust in the Lord was intact until his last day. He never questioned why he was chosen to suffer through illness like that, but after he passed away, I struggled with the idea of a loving God who listened and answered prayer and could let this happen to him and to my family. And that doubt remained in the back of my mind and it was compounded when I started medical school. In part, this was due to the fact that really for the first time, I found myself in close community with people who were just as devout to other faiths as I was to my own. I had a friend who was an Orthodox Jew who would walk 45 minutes to his rotations on Saturdays because it was against his beliefs to operate a car. I had Muslim classmates who were unyieldingly assured that their narrative of God's relationship with mankind was the accurate one, and mine was not. Some of my classmates and mentors believed that spirituality was antithetical to the scientific process, but that sentiment was actually much less common than I expected to find, which I was grateful for. The diversity of my friends' beliefs was illuminating, but it was also very confusing. Leaving Gordon and entering a world of religious diversity actually felt, at the time, a bit like an exile into the desert, with arbitrary reference points and vague navigability. Life at Gordon was pleasantly saturated with spirituality. It was woven through the academic curriculum. It fed the art scene. It was very often the focus of casual conversation in Lane or in Gillies. Variations in opinion and orthodoxy existed, but by my memory, they were mostly within a reasonably small 
margin of difference. During my time at Gordon, I would have easily said that my faith system was the foundation on which every other facet of my life rested. And one thing we all need to guard ourselves against if we find ourselves outside a faith-centered community is allowing our beliefs to become just one part of our identity on equal footing with our profession or our political views or our hobbies. I say this because if you're not careful about giving your faith its proper place in your life, then it becomes something that's easy to discard or rationalize your way around, especially in times of stress or conflict. A few months into my intern year on a day off, after a particularly challenging rotation, during which I encountered a number of dying patients and end-stage illnesses, I can distinctly remember sitting in our apartment in Providence and thinking, maybe I'll try to do this without Jesus for a while. The tension between the idea of a loving God and the experience of suffering was becoming exhausting to me. And since suffering seemed to be something I was encountering on a daily basis, I started to entertain the possibility that maybe God wasn't as loving or wasn't as powerful as I had once believed. It was the smallest moment. I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't make any bold declaration about my desire to depart from the faith or from the church. I didn't have a serious conversation with my wife about the possibility of an agnostic approach to life. That's a secondary lesson. Always have a serious conversation with whoever's in your life about things like this. For the first time in my conscious life, I decided not to believe in a creator who loves us and who sent his son to redeem the world. And thankfully, the eventual outcome was exactly the opposite. The next day I returned to the inpatient wards, I proceeded to pass in and out of patient rooms, addressing symptoms, adjusting medications, and what I discovered is that without the foundation of spirituality, which I have since come to recognize as the Holy Spirit, the experience felt as dry as a bone. I think I got a taste of the starkness of human suffering without the hope for something deeper, and it felt profoundly empty. Over time, I've come to recognize that another rationale that I had for wanting to take a step away from Christianity was my own immature view that it was a limiting element in my life. I had constructed a confining faith, a narrow thing with rules and simplified categories. Rigid beliefs that I had felt started to separate me from my Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, and atheist colleagues and patients. I had also generated the subconscious fallacy that I was somehow set apart from the patients I was taking care of, many of whom had illnesses that were born from decisions they had made that conflicted with my ideas of a moral lifestyle. I wish I could claim that early in the training process, my faith was the, most, it was the thing that most informed my care for patients. But the truth is it was my care for patients that ultimately brought me back to a stronger, more loving, and more authentic faith. I met a woman with hepatitis C who contracted it from heroin use and developed cirrhosis and then liver cancer. Her liver was so diseased that it wasn't making clotting factors the proper way. And so when we biopsied her tumor, she slowly bled out into her abdomen and ultimately died. And her family invited me into the circle as they prayed for her in her last moments. I met a man with HIV and syphilis in his nervous system who needed to be admitted to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics. And I discovered that he was one of the most interesting and compassionate people I'd ever met, devoting his care, his life to care for the underserved population in Providence for very little recognition or reward. I admitted a patient who came to the hospital with abdominal pain and was found to have an unresectable gallbladder cancer. She was terrified to receive chemotherapy because she was transgender, and she knew that when her hair fell out, 
she would be at risk for violence because her features were masculine. I bring these patients into the conversation only because they're examples of people that I might not have come into contact with outside of our relationship in the hospital. And meeting them each changed me for the better. One of the things I have found about the practice of medicine is that my opinion about people's decisions or their beliefs or the lifestyles they've chosen doesn't factor into our relationship in the hospital. This has taught me the role of my opinion about these things outside of the hospital. At the medical school I graduated from, we don't take the Hippocratic Oath. We take the Oath of Maimonides. And this oath was used as we started our careers as independent physicians to express our contract with the patient community. My favorite line from that oath reads, may I never see anything in the patient other than a fellow creature in pain. And this perspective has been a great gift to me because it has forced me to see past my own categories and labels, especially the ones I apply to myself. Unlike my conscious moment of departure from the faith, there was no single moment that I can remember that marked my return. There was no mystical experience, no audible voice from heaven that I was responding to. The process has been a gradual reorientation of my own understanding and the meaning of Christ's gift to the world and of the value of the Holy Spirit in our lives, a presence that provides inarticulable depth and meaning. Christ came to earth to liberate us, not to confine us, not to classify us or to label us. A read through the New Testament demonstrates again and again that one of Christ's missions was to eradicate man-made categories, Greek or Jew, slave or free. One more patient I would like to tell you about is an older gentleman that I met about three months ago. He was referred to my clinic when his gastroenterologist found a large esophageal mass at the entrance to his stomach. And on CAT scan, we found another mass in his pancreas and another in his liver. Ultimately came to learn that he had two separate simultaneous cancers, one of which was stage four. I met with the man and his wife to talk about what we had found and that we might be able to extend his life with chemotherapy, but that we would not be able to cure him. Of any of the patients that I've met over my career, he was the one I would have expected to express some resentment, or at least some incredulity, about having been diagnosed with two terrible cancers at the same time, neither of which were related to his lifestyle or any personal choice. After my news, the patient and his wife were sad, but they were surprisingly unshaken. For a moment, I wasn't sure if they understood the significance of what I had told them. So I paused for a moment to let them absorb the information. The typical emotional response at this point is fear or anger, some other form of distress. And he was calm. He responded, what do I have to worry about? I believe in Jesus Christ and death doesn't scare me. I'll be sad to leave my wife, but I know I'll see her again too. He was just given what was likely the worst news of his life and the foundation of faith upon which he had built his life did not even shudder. And that is a liberating faith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. So deeply appreciative of your reminder that we are fellow creatures in pain, Maimonides. We're going to switch now to hear from our chaplain, Tom Haugen. And again, rather than emphasizing his academic credentials, 
I would like to tell you that he not only pastors students at Gordon, but he has a history of pastoring even before coming here. And I think one of the things we would all say about Tom is his deep heart for nurturing faith, listening carefully, and walking with people as they wrestle and struggle. So Tom, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, for sharing uh, so openly with us. And it's hard to follow up with something like this. And, and I really, as I read through Dr. Bishop's remarks and, and knowing what my expertise are and where my heart lies is, and I'm so glad that Elaine mentioned that, Dr. Phillips saying that, I do love walking with people in the midst of both the highs and the lows. And I, when I went to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, I started praying through, I saw uh, Masters of Arts in Counseling students, and I was in the MDiv program training for pastoral ministry, and I thought how attractive that might be to, to go to an office and listen all day to people's struggles and process that, and that's a wonderful call and gift. But I realized that I wouldn't be able to walk with people in the high times of life in that type of a, a setting. So I was drawn more and more to the MDiv setting. And, and what I want to talk about is the idea of, uh, uh, as followers of Christ, we are called to serve the Lord with our whole heart wherever we are placed. And, and I want to broaden the discussion out a little bit. I, of course, I, I have personal experience in in the importance of bringing Christ to the oncology ward. My mother, on my 40th birthday, called me up to wish me a happy birthday, and I was driving up 128, uh, February 9th, and that's so if you want to send me a birthday present, you can <laughs> note that. I love my birthday. But this was a hard birthday, because my mom called me up and tried to wish me a happy birthday and always recalls the story of University of Washington Hospital and a snowy day and me being born and, and uh, she started crying. And I thought it was typical crying because her son was getting older and, and she said, I have cancer. And I pulled over the car and I, I listened and we prayed and we cried together. And I said, mom, we're, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna, we're gonna fight this and we're gonna get through this. And I love you and I'm here for you. And and I know uh, my mom who loves Jesus, I flew down to Georgia for some of her, her treatments with her, and I know that she brought Christ even to the midst of, of that and also appreciated any time that someone would put a hand on her shoulder and give her hope and encouragement. And whether it's overt or covert, it's still an important ministry. Os Guinness, in his book, The Call, says that Christians have a primary call and a secondary call. And for you college students praying through what is your call, that's a question we ask a lot, isn't it? What do, you, what do you want me to do with my life, Lord? These terms help me tremendously. The primary call is the same for every follower of Jesus Christ, Os Guinness says. It comes from Matthew 27, 37 through 39. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. It's the greatest command. When we say yes to Jesus, our primary call is to love God and to love others. But then Os Guinness goes on to say that the secondary call is how we live that primary call out in the world. And that is as different as every single individual personality that God has created. And, and you're not just one in 200 billion, you are one in, and you have to take the number of every human being that has ever been created on this planet to find out how uniquely and individually you, made, you are made for, for God's glory and in his image. So our secondary call is how we, we love God and love others with our gifts, our talents, our passions, and our opportunities. So how we are called to love God and love others others can take on multiple creative forms. And for Dr. Bishop, this call is a call to love God and love others as a father and as a doctor and as a friend and in many other ways. For me, it is to be a, a father and a husband and to be a, a chaplain at, at 
campus pastor here at Gordon College. And Dr. Bishop spoke of the philosophy behind the, the patient care and the practice of medicine, medicine and the process of learning that craft. I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy behind the practice of pastoral care and the process of learning that craft. And I, I was introduced to Christ through Young Life at a summer camp. And so my first school of pastoral ministry began uh, by a Young Life leader named Dickie Barlow, who was prematurely going bald, but was one of the funnest, most amazing, godly people I've ever met. And I came to Dickie and I said, it was my senior year, I wasn't a Christian, and he looked at me, he said, you look sad. He had diagnosed something in me. You look sad. And I said, yeah, I'm sad. He said, what's going on? This is a long story. I'll give you a little snippet here. But I said, well, my dad just called me. My parents were divorced. It was Valentine's Day, and my dad just called me and told me he's flying to Las Vegas and he's getting married to a woman I've never met. It was hard news. That's sort of hard news. And Dickie listened and cared for me. And I remember something different about the way that he cared for me that was not giving me advice or the 10 steps to recovery or 14 things I needed to do. He just shook his head and said, I'm so sorry, but I, I love you and I'm here for you. So as a young life leader myself, after I came to Christ at this camp, I got involved at the University of Georgia as a volunteer young life leader. And so I got to model that same sort of pastoral care that Dickie Barlow showed me, building relationships with students, earning the right to walk with them through the highs and lows of, of the high school adolescent experience. Can you think of a more volatile time? I mean, really. And I offered hope through friendship, always pointing them to the hope that I found in Jesus Christ. Paul says, we comfort those with all the comfort we ourselves have received through Christ. After college, I was hired as a youth pastor of a small church in Monroe, Georgia, where I learned pastoral ministry under the watchful care and eye of the Reverend Foley Beach. That name may mean something to some of you. He's now the Archbishop of the Anglican Church of North America. But Foley Beach wanted a relational presence in his youth ministry, and he called me up and said, I, I hear you're a pretty good young life leader, and I need that in my church. Could you be our youth pastor? So Foley took me on hospital visits and home visits, retirement home visits. He allowed me to preach and watch over his shoulder as he cared for a congregation like I've never seen anyone care for a congregation. He taught me how to love people, how to pray with them, how to listen, how to stay grounded in God's word no matter what storm raged around and always pointed me back to Jesus. And then after two years, I think he realized that I needed a little training, more than he could give me. And he sent me up to this place called Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. So I loaded up my truck and I drove up the highway from Georgia, fearful of what the Yankees might do if they found a boy from Georgia loose on the streets of Wenham, but they were very kind and gentle for the most part. <laughs> At Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, my training took on a much more formal and academic rigor, concepts and terms that I'd never heard before, and I actually had to practice ministry things on uh, people I couldn't really hurt that much. I remember walking into uh, the apartment after I, my wife also has her MDiv, and she was practicing a sermon that she was preaching, and she had lined up about five stuffed animals right there. It's really hard to mess up a congregation of stuffed animals. And I had to practice a baby dedication and borrowed my neighbors. They wouldn't let me actually use their real live baby, but they let me borrow the American Girl doll version. I looked a little stiff holding those things. Pastors have to train for these things. I served under a pastor doing my mentored ministry. His name is David Forsyth, whose wife Sue runs our health center here at the First Baptist Church of Manchester by the Sea. I think it has a different name now. I read about pastoral care. I wrote papers. I took tests. I practiced various scenarios in the classroom, in the laboratory, triads, pastoral counseling issues. We were protected from doing too much damage. As one of my professors, Christy Wilson, told me, 
You have a dull axe blade. It will cut wood, but it won't do it very efficiently, and it'll do damage to the log. So we're going to sharpen your axe blade here and teach you how to cut wood more efficiently and effectively. Christy Wilson was a gem. After graduating from Gordon-Conwell and the University of Edinburgh, my wife and I went on staff at a 10,000-member church called Peachtree Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia. We experienced many opportunities for giving pastoral care with the young adults we were called to care for. There were 19 pastors, and we would rotate a shift of carrying a beeper. Yes, it was 2002, and beepers were all the rage still. But this beeper had a special function. In a church of 10,000, when something went awry pastorally, the beeper would go off and your heart would stop because you knew that you were heading down to the emergency room, probably to comfort a parent whose son had just died in a motorcycle accident or who was fighting for his or her life in the hospital ward. When that beeper went off, it meant that I began to pray as I drove to the hospital, not knowing what awaited me at the other end but knowing that I was bringing Christ to a place where Christ desperately needed to go. And I realized in those moments that that was a privilege. And it's a privilege to be with people, and I think Dr. Bishop would agree, in those moments of great distress. As hard as they are, it is a privilege. After two years at Peachtree Presbyterian Church, I went on staff at a church in Zurich, Switzerland, where for seven years, I administered pastoral care to a congregation of 600 from 60 different countries. The issues that we, we dealt with were so wide in variety and creative, but it was a wonderful place to continue to learn pastoral care. In Europe, they have a, a plate that they put on the back of a car when you're learning to drive. Does anyone know what it is? It says L for learner. And it's a warning to the people around you that this person's learning how to drive. And I've often felt like in my office that I should have an L plate up constantly as a warning to you when you come in and share your heart with me and want me to help direct you back to Christ that I'm still learning what it means to love people in the midst of pain. So after 27 years of pastoral ministry experience, I still have the L plate firmly fixed in learning what it means but I will say this, I've learned two important lessons. Learning to listen and love God and God's word is the first lesson. And the second is learning to love and listen to people. Learning to love God and love God's word. Learning to listen and care for people. Learning to love God and God's word and God's people means that we need to slow down, doesn't it? And that's not easy for us in this multitasking, smartphone, constant connectedness, pace of life. Haddon Robinson, one of my preaching professors at Gordon-Conwell, pulled me aside and he said, you're a rare breed at seminary, Tom. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're an extrovert. And extroverts don't typically survive in seminary. And I was scared. What do you mean? He said, well, you see, Tom, extroverts don't know how to study. You don't know how to lock yourself up in the library and really take the time that it means to get the grades that you need to get out of this place. So go find the darkest corner of the library you can find where you won't even know that people are around. For some of us who are maybe more introverted, it means getting out of that cubby and going out and seeing people when you really don't want to. But either way, I was taught the importance and in, in the habit of learning to listen to God's word and God's people. Do you know that Jesus was never in a hurry? Have you read the Gospels and ever seen a spot where Jesus was in a hurry? You know, there's only one spot in Scripture where he tells someone to hurry up. Do you know what it is? He tells Judas in John 13, 27, what you are about to do? Hurry up. Do it quickly. You know what Judas was about to do, right? The Bible teaches that God is often underwhelmed by our greatest and best efforts and unimpressed with our most spectacular achievements. David Roper, who's one of my favorite writers, a fly fishing pastor, and if you know me, you know I love fly fishing, and pastoring are two of my favorite things. 
puts him together in such a great way. He says, it's not what we do for him that matters, nor should it matter much to us. What matters most is what we are to him. He goes on to point out that at the baptism of Jesus, this is my son whom I love, I'm well pleased. Jesus hadn't done anything yet, except for be born. Pastoral care is a call to enter into the mess of life with people. Pastor and author David Hansen, who's another fly fishing pastor, there's a theme here. And the art of pastoring says that pastors need to smell the bad breath of a cancer patient. I read that in seminary, I highlighted it, and I thought that's pastoral ministry right there. Pastors need to smell the bad breath of the cancer patient. And that means leaning in closely and, and entering into suffering. Suffering is part of living in a fallen world, and pastoral care means willingly enter into the mess of people's life. In chapel right now, we're going through the seven signs in the gospel according to John. And last week, I preached on John chapter 5 in an account where a man was sitting by a pool. We don't know for 38 years, but for 38 years, he couldn't move. For 38 years, this man couldn't move, and he was at this pool, and I called that pool a a hospital without walls or doctors or hope. And he's at this pool waiting for the water to possibly stir so he can get in and get better. Hundreds of men, women, and children who were sick and lame and diseased were by that pool, placing their hope when the water would be stirred. But Jesus, when he comes into Jerusalem, he doesn't, he doesn't enter into the temple where the festival is going on. He goes to that pool. And there were countless men and women there, and he picked one of them. What about the others? Have you ever thought about what he, why didn't he heal all of them? Well, because these signs and miracles point to a greater life-changing and eternal truth that as followers of Christ, we put our hope in something much more than just the physical healing. The seven signs of John's gospel are not a destination, but they point to a greater life-changing truth about Jesus Christ. John 20, 30, and 31 says that, that all sorts of other signs could have been talked about, but these signs that John chose He recorded those so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. There's not a promise of health, prosperity, happiness, but there is a promise of a Messiah, a greater hope, which your patient saw. God sees our greatest struggles as opportunities to cultivate us. He never wastes a hurt. He doesn't cause our pain, but he definitely uses it for his glory. He uses it to take our eyes off our own abilities and point us to himself. He uses pain to help us comfort others who are suffering as well. So we love God. We love others. We learn to listen to his word, and we learn to listen to people. And then in my case, I want to say that my pastor's heart is cultivated most as I look at Scripture and I see, as as Dr. Bishop has pointed out, that every human being is made in the image of God and has dignity and value and worth. Yes, we are fallen and we live in a fallen world where there's unimaginable suffering, But God entered into that suffering because of his love for his people. For God so loved the world that he entered in, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. People are souls to care for, not problems to solve. People are souls to care for, not problems to solve. So as we love God and we love people, we need to be compassionate. And that Greek word, compassion, splachnitsomai, isn't that a great word? (laughs) Dr. Bishop knows where this comes from. It's where we get our word spleen from. The Greek word, it, 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 it really is not a light word. It is a enter into, feel in the deepest part of our gut, the pain of others. And that's what we're called to do as Christians wherever we are placed, in the classroom, in the office, 
in a hospital, in a church, outdoors, wherever we are placed. We rejoice with those who rejoice, and we mourn with those who mourn, following the example of Christ. I really appreciate thinking through this process with you all, and I'm so grateful for your attentiveness, and I know that there are some questions and answers that might need to be given out now, but I will turn it back over to Elaine.